Uh, hello and welcome to episode 101 of Retro Power Uncut. Um, it's obviously been, I think, three weeks since we last showed what we're doing in the workshop because we've had two, we did the, the what was supposed to be a single episode, 100, um, where Nat and I were going to interview all the staff, so, you know, responding to requests to meet the guys, basically. That ended up so long that we had to split that episode in two. Uh, and then before that was the also focus on metal shaping. So it's actually three weeks worth, which I suspect means this episode is going to be quite long because there's a lot happened in those three weeks. Um, Land Cruiser, last episode, we were just sort of fitting up the bodywork on it. We'd, we're happy we'd resolve some alignment issues on that lot. Uh, and then we were able to wheel it outside for the first time, which was quite cool. It's always nice when you've got all the panel work on there just to get it outside in the sun and stand back from it. Because it sounds odd to say, but when you're in the workshop, you're always close to everything. And it's lovely to get a bit of a different perspective on it and see it outside. So that was nice. Um, quite a lot of the panel work is actually back off at the minute. Um, just because various fasteners um, are away being xylan coated. So like all the, um, all the bolts are going black on the outside and they're being black xylan coated. So the bonnet hinge bolts are away at the minute. Bonnet hinges are just being machined at the moment. Um, but lots going on elsewhere. So Bobby, who you actually saw in the interview videos, but hadn't started when we were last doing a workshop, sort of whip round, um, was straight on to a job which we knew was coming up the shifter um, cable detent crank arrangement. So it's an auto box in this. We've got a nice uh, low car, low car shifter from the States. Two of them, in fact, one for the range change, one for the main change. And they have like a push button and have various notches. Now they don't do one specifically for a Toyota auto box. So we got a generic one for like a GM gearbox. Um, so Bobby's task on this was to ascertain the number of degrees between each of the shifts on the box and remake the little um, sort of notched out detent plate on the shifter to match those positions and make the crank on the gearbox that the cable attaches to. So now we've got a setup where we've got a nice good looking aftermarket shifter that has shift positions that match the gearbox. Um, so that was a, a nice job to tick off. Uh, he also did the gear position sensor. So it's done a bracket amount of sensor on the box that has a link rod down to the other side of the shift rod on the gearbox, which moves when you shift into the different gears. And that basically tells the Dakota digital um, control box that controls the instrument panel on this um, what gear it's in according to what voltage it gets through the, through the variable resistor on the sensor. Uh, and that displays what gear you're in on the dash uh, and does a couple of other things as well. So it also, when you're in reverse, it's got an output for the reverse light, so we don't need to use a switch on the gearbox. Um, and there's something else on that as well of relevance. Oh, the neutral safety switch. So it only allows the start circuit to work when it's in neutral or park. And that's actually controlled by the Motec PDM. So there's an output from the Dakota Digital, which is the it's in neutral output. And that goes to an input on the PDM which, which it needs to see in order to engage the starter motor when you turn the key. So that was another job ticked off. And we've been doing the initial mounting of the actuator for the electric handbrake. We're running the MR2 rear handbrake calipers on this, but there's, we're using an e-stop electric handbrake, which is basically a linear actuator that pulls the cables. So it's done the mounting for that, and we're just waiting for some cables to arrive to finish that job. Um, Engine bay wise, we did the mock-up of the radiator finally. Now we've got all the front end in and this radiator frame. Um, we've done that. Concept Racing have now got the mock-up radiator with all the changes noted on it. So they're gonna make me the alloy radiator that's gonna be the final one. Um, and one of the things on that is that we're doing an integral transmission cooler in the bottom tank of the radiator. So George has drawn up like a little billet panel uh, and, the, and the sort of, um, threaded flange that it fits to. So that'll be welded into the radiator. The, the billet panel bolts to it with an O-ring seal and then the, the cooler core actually O-rings with lock nuts through that panel. So you can take the whole transmission cooler core out of the bottom tank of the radiator for serviceability. Um, so that's underway. And speaking of concept racing, um, these tanks have just arrived. So we made these little saddles that go on the side of the radiator mount frame. Um, and then Concept Racing have made us some little tanks that fit perfectly in those saddles. Um, this one's screen wash. That's the expansion overflow catch tank for the radiator. Uh, so everything looking pretty good on this. Um, waiting for the Xylan batch back. That'll mean we can get all the panels on for the final time, get the radiator in, and then we're gonna be looking at inlet manifold and 
yeah, a bit of general assembly work on that. Um, so that's where we're at on that. Um, I'm going to mention actually Utah next. So we've been just going through, continuing with the little nitpicking. We finished our breather vent setup, which seems to have worked. Um, I've, I've been working on a frustrating one today and that the screen wash pipe had come off one of the jets, which are fed from inside the car. So when you're doing the screen wash, it was jetting out in the footwell um, and they're incredibly difficult to get to. So I had to take a lot of the dash out to get to that. But I have sorted that now. And um, there was a tiny coolant weep on a temp sensor in the head. So um, James and Adam, I think, resolved that. Um, we added some more caster angle onto it. It's always an, an awkward one on these because originally they had zero caster angle, which makes the steering, it worked well with the steering box, where the steering was very heavy. It makes the steering very light, but it means there's not much self centering. Um, and although I was very happy with the precision of the steering, the combination of quite light, quite precise steering with zero self-centering does make it feel a little bit light. So we've added as much caster as we can just by shimming the, the standard joints back, which has made quite a marked improvement actually on the on the feel of the steering. Uh, so it just feels a little bit more stable. So I'm, I'm happy with that change as well. Um, so yeah, this is more or less ready now to go back. I'm gonna do uh, a little test drive tomorrow because I'm trying to resolve a wind noise issue around the driver's door. And then that should be ready to go. Should be going on Friday. So that's that one. Um, you'll notice the Manta's actually back in the mix. So we've got that on the ramp to move forward with the next step. So last time we were on this, we got it fired up. Um, the owner came over and saw it running for the first time. Um, so next step really is to get it mechanically in a state where it can essentially drive. So um, brake plumbing is coming up on this, prop shaft design, making up the prop shaft center bearing cross member. Um, we're gonna get the wheels made for it, which are gonna be a split rim replica of the original Ronal five spokes that the 400s had, which should look very cool on it. Um, so yeah, just starting to chip away at the mechanical jobs on this to get to the point where it's not just running, but driving. Morris, few avenues. George finished his design for the um, steering column shroud. They've been 3D printed. We're using 3D prints as the final parts there. So they've now been sent off to Dean, who's upholstering those probably as we speak. Um, other interior jobs were, Rich was doing the rear bulkhead panel. So there's a subwoofer that goes on the rear bulkhead and we wanted to make a sort of surround for it that will all be wrapped in leather. So it looks more integrated into the design of the interior. So Rich has made that uh, and George has been on with interior design stuff as well, further to the column shroud. The door sort of handle pulls slash armrests. Um, we wanted to basically get the design nailed for the door card yeah, entirely and how the, there's going to be like a line of piping that runs around the dash and on the door cards and flows all the way around into that rear subwoofer surround panel. So we were just trying to nail the exact look for that. And then that leads on to the shape of the door pull armrest, which we've now pretty much settled on, got a 3D model done. We've just got to do a 3D print of that, check we're happy with how that feels ergonomically. And if that's all good, and the owner's happy with that, we'll go ahead, print the other one, and then we can get the door cards finalized in terms of getting the holes in them for those handles. Um, and then we can leather the handles, leather door cards, the rear trim panels can be leathered, all of that rear bulkhead bit. Um, and then that's, that's basically all the interior upholstery ready to, ready to go then. Um, at the moment, it's looking a bit forlorn because we had a bit of a disaster. This is one of those working on car swearing moments. We were just doing some wiring termination and we were checking which of the two switches on the gearbox, neutral and reverse, was the reverse switch so we could put the appropriate termination on our loom. And we discovered that it wasn't switching when you selected reverse. Uh, and it transpires when Nat did the tail housing swap, so it's an NC box with an NB tail housing, which allows you to move the gear shift forward. There's a, they, they all, one of the things they revised on it was the reverse switch position. So everything is the same, except the, the a little bit of the casting on the selector fork that does fifth and reverse is slightly different and suits the reverse switch in a revised position, which he hadn't noticed. Um, so it wasn't touching the reverse switch on this housing. So we've just had to take the gearbox out and swap that. Uh, it's basically just roll pinned onto the selector shaft. So swap the um, little selector fork from being the NC one to being the NB one, which now matches the reverse switch position. But that is the only change. And I think they did it 
because the reverse switch is almost impossible to get out in the old position and on the NC box, it's straight up from underneath. Um, so yeah, we'll have all that back together tomorrow with luck um, and looking slightly less forlorn and we can carry on with the exciting stuff. Yes, the, James just reminded me that the other thing which we were waiting for for quite a while was the tanks that go in the engine bay, which arrived. I think I did mention they'd arrived in the last episode, but they'd gone away for anodizing. They're now back for anodizing and fitted, which means we can crack on with getting all the heater and all the stuff in behind the dash, which we would be doing now, I think, if it wasn't for the fact that we were dropping the gearbox out. Um, so that's done. And also, I finished the mock-up radiator um, which has been sent over to Concept Racing. Again, they've got a good shout out this episode, haven't they? Um, to do the final radiator fabrication for that. So hopefully we'll get that back soon. We'll have the radiator in then and then we can button up the coolant plumbing. Oil plumbing, I think, is already done. Um, so we can pretty much fi finalize the plumbing. We were in the middle of doing the wiring, finishing off, which is why the gearbox and the reverse switch issue was uh, found. So yeah, things should progress very quickly with that, I think now. Uh, E-Type, uh, again, multiple jobs on this at the minute. Um, Bobby was plowing ahead with trying to get us to a stage where we can get the owner over for a trial sitting. So we'd already ascertained that the BMW, um, I think it's a, something like an F87 series or an F77 series, um, electric adjustable steering column was a nice fit in there. So while we did the final bracket, we just had it mocked up in place temporarily. He's done a proper mount for that now, so that's fully fitted. Um, so that gives us our steering wheel position. The steering wheel boss arrived for that. I had a, a sort of looking at pictures gamble that the um, E65 series spline was the same, which it is, so that fits on there nicely. We've got a steering wheel just thrown on there for the minute. And then the next conundrum is seats. And it's, the seating position is awkward on an E-Type. They are so small. I mean, the Series 1 was even smaller. The flat floor ones, the floor was considerably higher. Um, and then on the roads, even by this point, where they'd lengthened it so there's more leg room, the height on the Roadster is massively lower than the height on the 2 plus 2. So on the, on the Coupe one, there's three inches more headroom between the floor pan and the inside of the roof, which means that these are quite awkward to get especially if you're tall, um, a decent seating position where your head's not jammed into the roof. Um, and also get a seat in there that's supportive and you know, good for sort of performance driving, but still comfortable, but not so big that it A, looks ridiculous in there, and B, sits miles off the floor and means that you, you have the, the headroom head problem again. So we're going with a fairly tried and trusted Technique. I have actually seen this done in E-types, but we've used them a lot in other cars as MX-5 seats because they're just very compact, but also very supportive. Um, quite a clever design because the base of the seat drops down between the runners, which means you get a reasonable thickness of foam, but the seat is very low. The position is very low versus the runners. Um, so Bobby's just done some temporary brackets in there, done a little bit of fettling of the tunnel, um, but you really can't drop that much out of the sort of section of tunnel each side of the main transmission tunnel. <coughs> excuse me, because of exhaust clearance. Um, so to have decent ground clearance, you need the exhaust up in those little additional tunnels. And so you can't completely cut them out um, without compromising ground clearance. So it's, it's quite an awkward juggling act, um, but we're happy we've got that seat in a really good place now. I could fit in here with the, the hard top on. My, my head's just touching the roof, but I'm very tall in the upper body. I'm reasonably tall anyway, 6'3". The owner's, I think, 5'10", 5'11", so I'm hoping when he comes over for a test sitting, he's going to have sort of two inches at minimum above his head. So that'll be good. Um, we've got a pedal box mocked up in there at the minute as well for pedal position. Uh, and then James has been on with a few things as well. So he's done the bracketry for the electro-hydraulic steering pump that we're going to use. So we're using the Mondeo hydraulic steering rack with an electric pump. Um, which is, I think, Astra, Vauxhall Astra. And we've just got a scrapyard one there for the minute to mock up and make the brackets. Um, we're happy with that though, so we'll replace that with a new one in the final installation. Um, so that, really the reason for that is to get some of the, one of the components from the engine no longer on the engine. Now you could do electric aircon, but there's more power demand on the aircon than there is on the steering. Um, so we went with going, getting the steering electric pump down there. We're going to have the aircon compressor down here, which we'll be making the brackets for shortly. Alternator this side. It keeps the V clear, coil packs in the V, which will tucked in quite tight. 
so it should just look, look nice and sort of clean and <laughs> for a V12 Jag engine, relatively minimal. Um, and then he's also been working on the throttle body arrangement uh, and the electric actuator. So he'd done a quick bracket for that before. Um, he'd got the basic design in place for this. We wanted to do a full mock-up with all the linkage in place just to make sure everything cleared and we had the right kind of movement on everything. That highlighted a bit of a clearance issue between these link rods and the mounting here. So that's been revised, new 3D print mock-up made for that. And it's actually looking really good now. So I think he's pretty much ready to pull the trigger on having that machined as the final piece. Um, so yeah, hopefully, fingers crossed, that's all good. Um, Adam, Adam was on holiday for two weeks. So he was, the last time we saw him, he was still wiring the Mustang. Um, he's been away for two weeks, but back this week and back on with wiring the Mustang, which I think is at that sudden moment where you think it's going on forever and ever and ever. And you look around and think, actually, I'm about done here. Um, so I think tomorrow, we're probably going to get to the stage where we can actually fire some things up electrically, get the dash in there, get that working. And we'll be pretty much left with the rear end connections of which there are not that many rear lights, etc. So I would say another week and we'll be fully electrically complete on that. So very exciting because that's one of the last pieces of the puzzle. And I'm going to sidle back over here um, to the Stratos where I think I mentioned in the last video, there was a big push to get this ready for testing and complete um, and that's gone really well uh, so the sort of sequence of things we've been working on was leading up to getting the interior in because obviously i need need all that in there to actually sit in it and drive it so we were getting this bulkhead panel at the back here finished there's a little capping strip here which we hammered some studs into um, and wrapped it in alcantara and that basically finishes the top of that panel then it's been cut out and we've designed these little 3D printed inserts where the harness eye bolts fit so that they can actually clamp up completely up onto the metal bulkhead um, but have a nice, nicely finished recess around them for the, the harnesses to attach to. It look quite cool actually because they're kind of reminiscent of the bezels you actually have in a normal seat even though they're actually on the bulkhead. Uh, seats in, harnesses in, um, first time I've really seen the interior coming together properly and think it's looking great. I've got the door cards in, we've got the billet parts that George made as his first job as he mentioned in his interview video the little knobs that adjust the windows uh, we've just got to make some leather straps for the door release pull um, we've got a few little jobs like the gaiters for the gear stick and handbrake we've got to finish the seals around here but we've got everything in there that we needed to um, Bobby did the alignment on it uh, Adam did a full spanner check of everything on the car I did some final programming work on the ECU so it's got a life racing digital screen, keypad and PDM and e engine ECU and all of those things communicate via CAN bus so it's just basically a two wire uh, system that drawing all of those and that's how they all com communicate with one another um, and that's really good from an information point of view because on that screen I can basically pull in any piece of information from either the keypad, um, the PDM or the ECU, uh, which is very useful. I can see current being drawn by any individual electrical component on the car, um, and I can pull up any piece of information that the engine ECU has. So from you know throttle opening to lambda sensor, I mean on this it's fly by wire, so you can see um, the, re the sort of um, feedback readings from the fly by wire motor. And we put quite a lot of sensors in, in terms of temperatures and pressures. And one of them particularly I was keeping an eye on during testing is the air and coolant temps so we've got air temp sensor after the charge cooler which is basically the air intake into the engine temperature we've got one before the charge cooler as well after the supercharger to see what sort of temperatures are coming out the supercharger because these Eaton superchargers fantastic for performance but one of the downsides is they do generate a lot of heat um, and then we've, we've got a separately pumped charge cooler water system, electric pump on that with little radiators in the flanks fed by these vents exhausting here. Um, so I've got a charge cooler water temperature readout as well. And I can get all that information on the dash. Um, and that was quite important to get all that on the dash. So I had that when we were testing. Um, and yeah, building up to testing, getting things on like mirrors, getting the wiper on there. All of those sorts of things so I could make sure they weren't vibrating horrendously whilst on you know going along uh, and also you'll notice these now long-term viewers will remember we did make a set of intakes for this a while ago but both the owner and with hindsight myself weren't entirely happy with the design of them 
they just didn't quite weren't quite in keeping with some of the sort of triangular square edge shapes that we're introducing in other places so we revisited those and came up with these fabricated aluminium intakes that scott's made which i think are absolutely spot on now um, so we wanted those fitted as well so that it was it was true to its final um, setup whilst we were testing and then yesterday uh, we took the car down to Bista Heritage they've got a little track there that you can exclusively book it's only small but it's great for just shakedown testing um, and we gave it a, a, a good test there and it performed incredibly well no leaks really happy with the handling it's a bit cramped for me in there but that's no great surprise that you're just working with the constraints of the of the original car in that sense um, but yeah, it all felt good. Controls feel good. Steering's very responsive. Uh, engine is unbelievably responsive, as you expect for an Eaton supercharged 3.2 V6. It sounds incredible. Um, temperatures were generally good. It was interesting seeing those charge temperatures. I mean, we were seeing very high temperatures after the supercharger, up to sort of I'd say close to 80 degrees C. Um, but the charge cooler's consistently knocking 30 degrees out. Um, very good heat transfer so I never saw the charge air temperature as it exited the charge cooler more than a degree difference to the charge cooler water temperature which is quite amazing really because it just shows how good the transfer of heat between the two is um, so yeah we're pretty happy with that we wondered whether the actual air intake temperature wasn't great and maybe there was a lot of heat being kept in here because the air filter is just inside it doesn't have like a forced cold air feed um, so we actually ran it with the clamshell removed and it was worse so uh, it's in, that was interesting so it's evidently getting a good amount of cold air fed in through here to the air filter um, so yeah I think all in all uh, a good test, test session so I shall show you the footage of that because I'm sure you're dying to hear what the thing sounds like um, and then that can take over after that I'll see you next week That's it, as you are, as you are, as you are. Yeah.
Right, well, welcome to the fabrication shop for another week where quite a lot has been going on and I'm bound to forget the vast majority of it, I imagine. And I've got a list which I put in my pocket so I won't be able to check it anyway. So we'll see how we get on. So in the back of the Project One Escort, uh, we have a fully mounted subframe now. The final brackets have been fitted to that and they have been able to be fitted because various other tasks have happened. Uh, now the rear turrets have been welded in which has in turn enabled us to fit the uh, rear harness bar. And the rear harness bar has been fitted into a pocket which we've shaped into, well, the ends of the rear harness bar are attached to reinforcement plates. Those reinforcement plates sit into a pocket which has been shaped into the inner rear quarter panel. Uh, in order to do that, I made up a, a little uh, tool from some heavy steel plate that was profiled to the correct shape of the inside of the rear quarter and that had the same type of step depth and shape as the original parcel shelf recess in the inner quarter panel uh, and then clamped that tool into the quarter and then just hand beat the uh, metal in situ because obviously I can't really remove that piece to well to... Um, I could remove it reshape it and then weld it back in but that would probably cause more distortion than just re-beating that piece in situ so basically clamp the tool in place on the inner quarter beat the steel into it shape that area done that both sides so then the reinforcement plate sits into that rim that uh, recess which is shaped to receive the parcel shelf as well uh, and then the harness bar can then sit into that the harness bar has been drilled and had a 716 CONF, i.e. seat belt mounting thread, uh, threaded inserts put through it, four of those in situ. Uh, they were uh, machined and then partially tapped in the lathe to get them straight. Then they're TIG welded in, then they'll be, they're not actually done at the minute, but they'll be finished tapped in situ so that any bits of weld on the inside are taken out. They won't have gone all the way through, but just to ensure that the threads are clear, I actually finished tapped them in situ. Uh, so that's all in place. Then that was welded to the turret tops, sorry, the, tu the, the turret bodies. And at that point, that then meant that the rear turret jig could be removed because the turrets can no longer move in any of the directions they're not supposed to move in because they were welded to the uh, cut off chassis rails at the lower end into the wheel arch tub and to the harness bar at the top. So they're now in the correct places and can't move. So the turret jig was removed. Once the turret jig was removed, that's enabled us to access uh, the rear subframe so that we could uh, fabricate the remaining mounts for it. Um, so at the front end of that, I just, it's not really going to be on camera anyway, but I'll just move that pad out of the way. So we then uh, worked out a plan for finishing the rear floor area where that goes up and over the axle. We've had to make some allowances for exhaust clearance. Uh, on this car, because I've had to rate, because we've raised the axle centre line quite significantly compared to the previous one we did, uh, it's meant that the exhaust clearance is quite tight, uh, and it's meant that I've had to raise the floor a lot more than I have done before. So uh, to that end, we've I've then worked out how much to cut out to enable exhaust access and access for the other things we needed, and then worked out a pleasing shape for that whole area. Uh, trimmed the floor off, cut the floor off, and then made, drew up on CAD and made these uh, these sections here. We made a, we I drew through the, I actually took a, made a, a cardboard rubbing of the back edge of the cut off floor first to get the accurate, accurately established the shape of the back of this uh, transmission tunnel where it was cut off. So I made a cardboard rubbing of that. Photographed the cardboard rubbing. It's not really worth doing a full scan for this sort of job. Just took, did a photograph of the cardboard rubbing, put that into Fusion 360 as a canvas, scaled that into Fusion 360 so it was accurate, then used that as the basis for a sketch to do a half piece here to, to basically make half of this section. So used that canvas to, to give me the edges to make that, then drew that up on sheet metal, added the flanges for folding in various places to enable it to be spot welded in. Drew, drew those up, CNC plasma cut them, folded them, that's those made. Uh, and then from the same drawing, by offsetting the edges, made a press tool, um, which we could then put in the fly press to enable pressing of these. I've covered this before, but basically we make the outer section of the tool, the inner section of the tool, there's two pieces, both cut from three mil steel sheet on the CNC plasma. Um, and then we, I attach those. I actually usually use five minute araldite, but what I've uh, just tried and it worked really well was some of the, um, we use a, a Tessa clear 
um, tape for which we use for gluing rubber trims on uh, sticking rubber trims into apertures my former life I was involved in rubber extrusion making doing that for manufacturers and certainly Nissan and Toyota use that tape or a 3M equivalent of it for sticking um, the, the rubber trim seals into door trims and things the door door seals into their cars um, so I made use of this we made um, it's a tape we have here for doing various jobs like that I actually use that tape to stick the bottom and top tools to the bolsters in the fly press and that works really well. Uh, Tom's currently working on a bit which I started on a little bit earlier which was the rear chassis rail uh, diversion if you like where the chassis rail goes and diverts around the rear suspension turret. Um, it's quite an awkward piece to make and quite an awkward piece to draw. I actually drew that in CAD uh, as a sheet metal part in CAD so I could work out drew it in CAD so I could work out where the path of the uh, chassis rail went, um, drew up the developed sections for that and all the flanges and whatever, drew that in CAD, then flat and patterned it, cut it on the CNC plasma and then Tom's picked up the job from there and he's shaped it all, worked out the, with the required shape for it all, put it all in place, he's got them tacked in place now, he'll be fully welding them soon, he's just doing the side sections for those rear rails now, which is these pieces, this is this side, the other one's the other side, these are the side sections of the rail, which will then take the rail from the bottom section up to the top where the boot floor and the rear floor sort of section for inside the car will sit on top of that and then the bulk head will go down onto the top of that of the floor which is on top of that in turn all of this will make more sense when it's done really it's hard to explain in space at the minute but uh, that's that's basically what's being worked on there at the moment so in conjunction with uh, the work that's been going on in the back uh, the other area of significant progress is that Tom has also been working very hard on the dashboard for the car uh, and Jamie's captured all that, that in step-by-step -step footage, which is very nice. Um, it's basically a di more or less a direct copy of what we did in Gordon's car. Not quite, but almost a direct copy of what we did in Gordon's car. Um, and this time we've got the slight advantage of knowing we're doing two of them. As I say, they're very slightly different to uh, Gordon's in that we didn't have any, we haven't got any drawings from doing his, other than the centre gauge console. We did have the CAD drawing for that. Um, now, now, Gordon's was actually handmade and not from the CAD drawing, so it was actually slightly different to the CAD drawing. In the instance in this car, we've actually used the CAD drawing to cut out the part for the dashboard and also to make the tools for hammer forming and shaping that section for the centre of the dash. So we CNC cut uh, some 6mm plate for, uh, to clamp that section up and then Tom's beaten the... Uh, beaten the centre part of the dash around that 6mm tool to, to form the flanges around the edge. So yes, on, on, on the instance of that, uh, the dashboard for this car, we've actually used the CAD model from the start to the finish of making that centre part of this dash. All the rest of it's handmade, but for the centre section, we've actually used the CAD model from the start to the finish of that. So we cut the blank part, i.e. the piece of metal with the four holes for the four gauges and the slot, which is where the um, HVAC controls will live. Uh, we, we cut that, the blank for that, which all the gauges would actually fit into and will be the final part of the dash. We cut that with the CNC plasma with a significant amount of extra material around it to allow the forming of the return on that part. And then from the same CAD model, and again, a bit like the press tool we used in the back, off, by offsetting lines from all the edges, we uh, then produced, we allowed for various offsets for shaping the material and then cut uh, a pair of tools in six millimeter plate uh, with bolt holes through them in various places which were judiciously positioned so that they could be accessed through the so the bolts had access through the holes for the gauges and for the um, uh, HVAC controls so that we could bolt the two, two pieces of six millimetre plate together with that with the final piece of dash sandwiched between the two and that enables us to then hammer form after grinding some nice radius radii on the corners of the six mil plate enabled us to then hammer form the edges of the recess for the dash around that uh, around that tool uh, and then Tom's uh, heated the edges to enable us to shrink that because there's quite a lot of material shrinkage on those corners on those radius corners so he's then heated and hot shrunk that material on those corners using a wooden hammer and then an aluminium hammer over a large heavy round dolly um, just to just to shrink the material in 
Um, so that's how he's shaped that centre section. The rest of it is then cardboard templated. He's made the uh, tube up for the lower section of the dash, uh, fought, shaped all that up and worked out the lens for that, worked out the shape for that. That will also carry the steering column, made the end plates for that so he can tack that in place between the A pillars. And uh, say so then he's used his cardboard templates to shape up the centre section of the dash and the lower section of the dash in various pieces and tack all of those together along with the gauge console for the middle. And then perhaps uh, very interestingly as part of that metal work, making up the ends of, of the dash, there are compound curvature on the ends. There's a few areas of quite significant curvature, but particular, a particular note with the two end sections of the dash where there's quite a lot of compound curvature. And they're actually they're beaten out and then wheeled up. Um, on, the, on the English wheel to, to shape those. But to replicate that from one side to the other, to get some symmetry, we've used an, uh, an idea unashamedly copied from Ray Shaleen, who's one of the guys that we sort of watch a little bit of metal shaping from online, which is making a flex, flexible shape pattern. We use um, fiberglass reinforced packing tape uh, which you may have seen used to package sort of metal from the from metal suppliers and things like that. It's basically heavy things where tape tends to tear. You can use a, a fiberglass reinforced tape which just has straight lines of fiberglass uh, in, in, in the adhesive tape. Um, so you basically make a crosshatch mesh of that uh, fiberglass tape and stick it over the one side that you've already made. Uh, and, and lay that up as, a, as, a, as I say, a, a, cro a 90 degrees cross-hatched mesh of that tape. Uh, and once that's done, trim it around the edges, peel it off, and then what will happen, you can actually flick it inside out then. You can pop that tape pattern, which holds its curve, inside out, and then use that tape pattern as, a, as, a, as a, like a little tiny mobile jig to check the shape of the other side. And it's amazing how accurately you can control or how can check the curvature of a panel using that sort of tape pattern with it popped inside out. Basically, when you know it fits with no bagginess, um, but, but it is long enough to go completely over the shape, you know you've got the shape pretty much bang on correct. It's very, very accurate way without having to make complex templates to check the shape or something like that. So that's how Tom's checked the, 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 the two ends of the dash are within reason and symmetrical and then with a lot of metal finishing tidying sanding filing adjusting and general fiddling it's got that dash to be pretty darn good now and that's all tack welded in place ready to be fully spot welded along the top once he's finished the instrument panel for the that's ahead of the driver the instrument binnacle however we're not going to carry on with the instrument binnacle he started he's done the rough shaping on that pattern and made the actual sort of canister if you like that holds the two main instruments we're not going to do any more on that until we finalise the seating position. To that end, we've obtained some very poorly um, Capri Recaro seats because we're going to use, I've forgotten what they're called now, somebody will correct me here, but basically we will be using new Recaro seats of that design in, in these cars. Um, and in this car and its sister car, we'll be using that type of seat. So for the time being, for mock-up, we've just got some cheap, old, worn-out ones from Capri's. Um, so that we can use those to set the seating position and do a seating mock-up so that we know exactly what's going on there. So that's just thrown in at the minute, sat on some wooden blocks. My next job is to work out the exact mounting position for that um, and then uh, design the, the boxes that the seat's got to sit on and how they're going to tie into the floor. So that's the next step with that. And then finally, I think we're getting there with the Escort. The, finally on this, uh, Rich Irving's been working on piecing the front suspension, the RICS WRC kit as it's called, for the front suspension, but with not with the Bilstein struts that that kit is designed to utilise, but with a set of Nitron struts that Nitron have made for us, uh, which you've seen in a previous episode being delivered. Um, he's now built those front strut assemblies onto the RICS WRC uprights um, with uh, we haven't put the brake brackets on at the minute actually I said not to bother putting those on at the minute um, but he's built the, them up with the uprights the compression struts and the track control arms so that imminently I can get on and have a look at getting the compression strut brackets fabricated onto the chassis rails and at that point we can build the front suspension up we're not very far away from being able to build the rear suspension up and really that'll be the, the next phase of operations will be to get the car rolling really but we've got a bit more sheet metal work I want to get finished prior to that so a bit of a juggle at, but that's pretty much where we're at with the Escort. Whew. So <laughs> at that point I'm going to move along and wander down to where Stu's been beavering away and still is beavering away in fact on the uh, Churchill Jag. We'll wander around the back here, walk past Stu, make him feel awkward. <laughs> I'm right here and conveniently on the floor 
you can see the two quarter panels and that's a significant chunk of Stu's work um, for, this, uh, for this video has been piecing those quarter panels together, getting them finished off, fitting the, fit, finishing off the welding on the last parts, metal finishing them, tapping and filing them and getting them all to the point where they're ready to go onto the car and then removing them, prepping the insides of them and getting those covered with a coat of uh, epoxy anti-corrosion primer so that when they go on for the final time we've got corrosion protection in, in, inside the quarter panels. Uh, all, in tandem with that he's then been doing some more fabrication work which I'm going to dart around here. The other significant progress is that you'll notice this hole here that was a great big hole is now blocked in um, and that's because Stu's fabricated the inner quarter panels for both sides uh, with some access holes in that enable us to get to the inside of the quarter panel and access fasteners because there's going to be some armrests attached to these when we've actually got all the interior put together. Um, we've got these reinforcers here which is sort of adds a bit of strength, a bit of safety, ties everything together a bit and also gives us a nicely reinforced section to attach armrests and trim parts to. Um, sort of thinking ahead to that stage because that's not all designed yet. Um, so he's got those quarter panel, the inner quarter panels made, finished, all the relevant bits fixed in like these little quarter window bracket holding tabs and various other things. Got those in place, lined up, welded those in and then again, like the inside of the quarter panels, he's, th those have all been brushed with, um, well those have been sprayed, these have been brushed, but with um, the uh, zinc anti-corrosion uh, epoxy primer also coated onto those. So now it's pretty much at the point where the quarter panels to go on there skipping around from that job to the back in tandem with doing that Stu's also done the work on provisions for the rear light fitment basically the housings for the rear lights so he made up a set of housings for the rear lights in fact I'm going to reach in here because conveniently he's left one of the fixtures here <laughs> he made up a set of housings for the rear lights which are these things here um, which look like this once they're installed basically made these tubes up which house the rear lights with the right fixings inside the back for the lights to attach to worked out the access for them how they're all going to be accessed and then cut those through which is quite a challenging job actually cut those through the rear panel through the inner rear panel and through the panel behind that in, very, in a couple of areas as well so cut those through got them all aligned and to the from the alignment point of view obviously he's had the laser and some measuring to get the levels and the heights and the, and the um, offsets correct but then to actually get the alignment dead square he's made up a little jig which you can see here which is a piece of heavy tube with a plate on the end it with drilled to fit the uh, light hole so, the, so that you can bolt the aperture from where the light would bolt on onto the tool and then the ends have been squared in the lathe so they're dead square and then had a section of um, angle iron 20, uh, three quarter or 20 mil angle iron tack welded onto them he's made a pair of those with these dead square onto the ends of that tube so that then those can be set on the car can set a straight edge across and clamp those two pieces of angle to the straight edge with the lights on the correct separation and ensures that the lights are sat exactly square to the to the to the uh, to the rear of the car, so that we haven't got any misalignment with the lights because it's actually very difficult. It's not something you can gauge by eye because of the curvature of the car. They actually look wrong, um, so it's very hard to gauge. So with this, that clamp dead square, we know that the lights are dead square onto the back of the car, and there's no misalignment issues because obviously with uh, with rear lights that's fairly crucial. So that was a, a good bit of lateral thinking. Uh, in terms of working, working out the, the, the best method of doing that. So that was that all done. So that in, then enabled the f finishing off of the fit, fitment of the rear panel and fixing that in place. Was the number plate? Re yeah, I think the number plate recess was already done, wasn't it? Yeah, they'd already done the number plate recess. Um, so at that point, yeah, that was all done. And that's also obviously tied into the quarters in that the rear section of the quarter could then be welded. Once the holes were done in that for the lights, then that it was grafted into the rest of the quarter panel, welded and metal finish there. So that was all done. Uh, and then while he was doing, getting bits ready for epoxy, obviously thinking ahead to the fact we're going to be doing an alloy boot lid, but we are going to use the original steel in a skin for uh, in a reinforced um, frame for that. He finished off straightening the rear frame uh, and then uh, cleaned that up on the inside using um, a strip and clean disc and coat, given that a good coat of um, the anti-corrosion epoxy as well so that that's then ready for us to move on to putting the aluminium skin on uh, further along the line. And then the current uh, tack, he's then moved on from doing the rear end 
Uh, he's then moved on because there's a couple of um, a couple of other things we need to verify on that. He's then moved on to the front end for a bit, where he's now working on the bulkhead area. Uh, we are waiting to just get hold of it, uh, and there's a bit of things up in the air a little bit engine-wise at the moment. Um, but we start, I'll, I'll elaborate on that further on a, f on a future episode. But at the moment, he started work on the bulkhead area. Uh, Rich is just out at the minute fetching a section of tube from Proformance Metals because we're going to put some um, further tube work into the dash area to support the dash and the heater unit um, and, to, and to support the bulkhead. Uh, we are using another vintage air heater unit in this, one of the Magnum, vintage air Magnum type heater units. This car is going left hand drive which is a distinct benefit and it means that we it's much easier than it normally is for us in right-hand drive cars to use one of the Vintage Air Magnum heater units. We actually at some point really need to talk to Vintage Air about whether it would be possible for them to do as a right-hand drive unit, uh, a, a version of their Magnum unit. But anyway, that's, another, that's all another aside. <laughs> He's currently working on the bulkhead, finishing the fabrication, well not finishing, starting the fabrication of that really, working out what to cut out and this morning um, we had a bit of a chat through a bit of a plan uh, and he's just rolled a section of I believe inch and a quarter tube uh, which is going to be the lower screen aperture support uh, and then later on um, when Rich gets back with it I think uh, probably tomorrow now still will be on with um, fabricating the lower dash support which is also going to carry the HVAC unit and tie the pillars together which is going to be done in two inch um, cold drawn seamless with a with a, it's actually got a couple of bends in that one the, the way it's going to fit into the car so that'll be nice to see when that's all fabricated and that pretty much I think I'm bound to have missed a few things but that pretty much ties up where we're at on Utah so moving on now on to Jensen next we have finished the work as far as we can now we're bound to have missed something but KS composites are also very good and we'll probably pick up on anything we've missed but as far as we can determine We've got everything finished as far as we can up to the point where it needs to go and have a mould taken from it. Um, KS requested that the shell go to them sanded to 320 grit. I don't know exactly what they do in terms of mould release, etc., etc. Um, but the request was that it went to them at 320 grit, which was fine by us because I was thinking we were going to need to get this as far as final paint. Um, uh, for them to take the moulds. They said 320 grit was good. Um, we've done a little bit of work on making a checking jig. George actually 3D uh, drew up and 3D printed um, a pair of checking jigs to just check the symmetry of this area on the shell because it was just not quite bang on. It was very, very close. It's just not quite bang on. It's very, very difficult to, the, the, to explain the, the difficulties here the shell wasn't symmetrical to start with they're trying to add symmetry to something that's nowhere near symmetrical to start with without them making it look wrong is quite difficult so we've had to juggle a couple of things but the key is that the outer edge of this area is symmetrical so that when we um that there was, there's going to be a machined aluminium bezel if you like a light receiver that actually carries the rear lights in this area this area is going to be cut out and there'll be a light receiver put into here but the light receiver needs to chiefly be symmetrical otherwise it's going to be really obvious if those parts are nowhere near the same one side of the car to the other so we've had to just do some final little tweaks here to make sure that that part of the car sits dead concentric to a machined part that's going to sit in there so happy with that now there's a bit of repriming and a bit of fiddling and a little bit more filler work and then a bit of repriming again done in that area to get that right but happy with that now the rear side moldings are back on the car and again everything's good there everything fits there's a few areas where there's sort of odd screws holding things together and bits but nothing that should be too detrimental to the molding process so as far as we can tell that's ready to go to KS so that's going next week to KS Composites and hopefully then the next steps will be a carbon one <laughs> there'll be a bit in between I don't know whether we might be able to go and get some bits of footage uh, over at KS in between times um, and there'll be I'm sure there'll be some toing and froing uh, around various areas as we go because there's bits of it that are just impossible to know until you're actually until the person actually gonna, that's got to make the mould is looking at it, we're just not going to know. But we're certainly very, very close to being to to what we, as far as we can tell, something that we can actually get a mould from fairly reliably. So that's where we're at with that. And then obviously, I've noticed the fact that the engine is no longer in it. Rich has pulled the uh, 
the Chevy, Chevy LSA crate engine, supercharged um, Chevrolet LS engine, which is over there on the trolley now, and the 6L80 transmission, which again, you won't have seen for a while because it's been buried in the car for a long time, but that's all been pulled out because there's no point having all that weight in it. Uh, going over to uh, KS, it might as well not have that in. We've messed about a bit and pieced the, um, the, uh, the Jensen, the original, uh, it's an interceptor steering rack on this, and the donor steering rack was pretty poorly uh, and it kind of disintegrated so i've just loosely pieced the rack back together so that we've got steering just to get it to ks and back we put some uh, we've put the sort of mock-up wheels on it again so we can get it to ks so it's all that's all now ready to go so that's where we're at with that then the other the sister car to project one mark one escort the other mark one escort we've been holding fire working on that just because we knew we weren't really in a position to be immediately doing any further work on it and where we were getting fairly close to getting the first car off the jig now and as soon as that car's off the jig this one can go on the jig um, onto the same set of fixtures that that one's on so to that end uh, rich has been working on this just taking it from we left it stripped more or less but still rolling uh, and rich has just finished taking the remains of the running gear off it we've cut he's cut the front wings off uh, made a sort of neat job of cutting the front wings off we'll probably we'll need to replace a lot of the surrounding bits on the car anyway but he's done a neat job so we're not sort of battling a big mess there so he's cleared all that up made a nice job of that uh, put the rotisserie ends on the shell so that we can get it onto the rotisserie we've generally got that ready the next step will be uh, scraping uh, all the under seal and mess off the underside um, and removing the seam sealer and then blasting it so whether that's next week or week after probably more likely the week after but that's uh, that's that's in the pipeline now for the next car in for blasting next body shell in for blasting and moving on from that talking on the subject of blasting we have the series 2 2 plus 2 e-type which is currently the uh, focus the main focus anyway um, and to the, uh, as I just mentioned a second ago uh, in terms of blasting uh, the first job well more or less the first job on receiving this was to get it blasted actually slightly prior to blasting it um, Mark went over and uh, DA prepped a lot of the areas that we knew we weren't going to be blasting so that they were already prepped prior to blasting so that we could epoxy them immediately after that uh, and not delay the process I'll come to that in a sec basically did some did various hand prep on the car then the uh, got it mounted on the rotisserie uh, refabricated the rotisserie because the original rotisserie for this car was a bit of a cobbled up affair because the car was pretty much disintegrated when we blasted it the first time. It was an extremely poorly shell. Um, so we redid the rotisserie a lot better <laughs> on the grounds that we knew the car was going to need to go on and off it a couple of times. Uh, and then we blasted the underside and inside of the body shell and then zinc metal sprayed uh, using our zinc flames, Metco zinc flame spray gun zinc metal sprayed all of the underbody, all of the underside of the shell, in the wheel arches, uh, the bulkhead, all, all uh, under the floor pans, under the uh, rear suspension crate assembly, all of, the, all of the areas that see the, the see salt on the road and see mess and grime on the road, they've all been zinc metal sprayed. And then immediately following that, the car was brought out of the paint booth, uh, out of the blast booth even, out of the blast room. The outer surfaces were again re-DA sanded very quickly. Uh, and any uh, other areas that weren't zinc metal sprayed that's, that were going to be epoxy primed were then very quickly re-prepped. Then the car was wheeled into the paint booth and the whole, everything other than the bits that were zinc metal sprayed were then um, painted with uh, uh, very high zinc content anti-corrosion epoxy primer that we use, a Celimix. Um, I think it's actually a, a designed to be a marine product, but it's uh, an anti-corrosion epoxy primer that we use on pretty much everything. We get on really well with it. Everything was uh, primed with that. And then the shell came into here for us to start panel work, uh, to start panel work, start filler work and prep work on it. Um, as anticipated, it needed remarkably little filler work. There were a couple of areas few little bits but nothing very dramatic it's a testament to very very high uh, quality metal work done on the shell that very very little filler work was needed a little bit there's always some anybody that says there's none is probably lying 
Um, you know, you could you could put yourself through weeks more work or do a few minutes of filler work. Um, and so there's a few minutes, not not much filler work at all really. And then spray surface, a polyester spray surface, which is the finish you can see here. Uh, it had several coats of um, polyester spray surfacer. Uh, and then they've been progressively blocked back. Uh, and I don't know, did we have a recoat on this or not? I can't, I, yeah, I think there was some patching um, recoats of uh, polyester. I don't think I had another full coat, just a, of some patched in areas, which were then re-blocked back. But it's pretty much getting there. All the outside surfaces are pretty much getting there. So when they were fairly close, it was then time to do some build-up work. We put the, what's to say, um, Gaz and Steve and Mark put the front end on, got that all lined up did the block work we actually did a little realign because one thing we've discovered and e-type experts will know this we don't because we're not e-type experts but the front uh, subframe on an e-type depending on the order in which you do up the bolts sit, sits in a different position um, so basically you you pretty much have to bolt it all up look at where your gaps were if you knew that the gaps were good before you unbolted it then bolt it all up and if they're not good try undoing all the bolts and doing them up in a different order and you'll generally find at that point you'll, it, the gaps will come good and that's exactly what we did we just slackened all the front frame off then did it all back up in a slightly different order and that brought uh, all the front end gaps to absolutely bang on exactly where they where we wanted them back to basically after paint there'll be four millimeter gaps or just just slightly under four millimeter gaps which is what we were aiming for um, and so that was all all, all perfect so then blocking was carried on on the front end. Uh, so that was all done and we're in a pretty good position. The seam sealing's all been done on the inside. Uh, we're in, one of the next tasks will be the seam sealing on the underside. But prior to that, and literally as we speak, they're trying desperately to do it quietly, which is quite difficult, is uh, they're stripping the front clam down because we've been working out a way of painting the front clam properly. It'd be interesting to know what other people in the E-type world sort of do. Again, we're, we're, we're green to E-types, we're not E-type experts, but basically that's one big rot trap. That, that's, a, that's an assembly that's gonna try and rust away from day one, that bonnet. Um, so we're gonna completely take that apart. We don't trust the primer that's already on it. They're supplied in some pretty dodgy coating. Um, from a well-known uh, parts supplier. Um, so we're stripping that completely apart, taking that all apart, I'm gonna re-prep all the internal surfaces, re-prep all the mating surfaces, and then we're gonna do the underside paint. Basically, we'll do all the primer work, inside and out, and all the underside paint work on that with it all in sections. Uh, and then and work, when we do the underside paint work, which will be largely tinted U-Pole uh, Raptor that we will lacquer, then when we do that, we will then blow that around all the edges, all the edges of the mating faces, so that then we can build that up and there'll be a good anti-corrosive and aesthetic coating on all the mating faces. And then once it's all reassembled, we'll re-block and refinish all the outer surfaces. Then we can paint the outside with it all assembled and we know that we've got, then got paint coverage over every part of it, over every surface, whether it's bolted together to another surface or not, there'll be paint coverage on it. Um, if you don't do it like that, there's a, a, a huge number of areas in there which would just have no paint on them, and it's it's just not acceptable. It's it's just it's just asking to rot away, and they did. It's easy to see why they rotted away because if you look at all the bolted joints, that's the first places they always dissolve. Um, so it's 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 easy to understand why they rot when you see how they're made. Um, so that's that's the rough order of events there, but it's it's qu there's quite quite a lot of work to do in terms of just dismantling all of that lot and piecing it all back together again and hoping to get it sort of roughly in the right place when we piece it back together and not have too much more work to do. The other side to that is we've been piecing together the um, pile of chrome parts for this which are in varying states of uh, decay. Um, most of them, a lot of them are actually reusable, perhaps most is an exaggeration, but a lot of the parts are actually reusable. They'll all need huge amounts of refinishing, re-chroming, straightening, various other things. Um, but a lot of them, because they were fairly heavily made originally, are actually reusable. So we've been just trial fitting a few of the chrome bits. We've got some work to do on the rear bumpers. We've got a little bit of work to do on the front bumpers. Um, we've got quite a lot of work to do on the grill and the aperture on the clam and various other things like that. Um, and then some of the chrome uh, finishes don't really have any bearing on the paintwork, but we've just checked that they don't, so we know where we're at with all of those. Um, and that's pretty much 
where we're at on the e-type. I think that pretty much sums up the, uh, the progress in here. And so I think at that point, that's probably a good point to call it uh, quits for another week. So uh, yeah, see you again soon.